Greetings from London. This is Mariam Sharif and welcome to the Star Moguls podcast. I have a lady who I met a few weeks ago. She is a GP and a specialist in women's health, family planning and menopause. 15 years of experience, a resident uh, doctor on the BBC Breakfast and um, ITV. Her debut book, which is The Knowledge, which I picked up a few weeks ago, is who Yay. we are discussing, and it is Nigat, Dr. Nigat Arif. Welcome, Dr. Nigat. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Hi, Aslam Alekum. I feel like I already know you. <laughs> I've been following you for a while because I think we connected on LinkedIn, and I yeah. said, and you asked me, would you be on my podcast? And I never say no. I'm always like, yes, anyone that will have me talking about women's health, I'll be there. And um, for one thing or another, we just never managed to get a date in the diary until I met you at the Sagorn Through Cancer afternoon tea at Nice Stone Slam. Absolutely, absolutely. But I think it, it I think because you've been on our TV screens, I feel like you're part of the family. Oh, that's so kind. <laughs> it feels very quick to me because in the pandemic um, in 2020, I started doing BBC Breakfast. And I became the regular doctor for two years, every Monday mornings before going to my surgery, talking about what I'm doing as a GP in the pandemic. And then I started doing this morning as well. So I appreciate not everybody watches daytime TV, but being on daytime TV does give the sense of familiarity for some people, either if you're catching me at 6.30 in the morning on BBC Breakfast or maybe around 10.30 in the morning on this morning. So it's it's been a lovely mixture of audience and, and different responses from different audiences. But let's um, discuss your debut book, The Knowledge, because I have been going through it. And in your introduction, you say that it was really to, uh, that women have, and especially South Asian women, have this stigma and taboo. And this is what you wanted to really erase. You wanted to create an understanding for them. Um, and the book is also really well designed. It is your guide to female health from menstruation to menopause, but you've divided it into three sections. So the the puberty, then fertility, and then uh, menopause. I have been going through the book and I absolutely love it. It's an easy read with such great illustrations and facts that, you know, that, that come out. So the first part, when the body changes, and as you become a woman and you become more self-aware is really when you have your period as a woman. Yeah. So this book was really because I had to unlearn a lot of shame around our bodies. Uh, I had to unlearn the stigma and the taboo. The fact that being a Punjabi woman, um, uh, my background from Pakistan is we're from Bahawalpur, Bahawal Nagar. And I'm actually born in a, in a small village called Tati Fateh, just outside of uh, Bahawalpur. And so I came here when I was nine years old. A lot of my family still live in Chishtina in Pakistan, which is about eight hour drive out of Lahore. So we don't have the words for say breasts, vulvas, vaginas. We don't have a word for menopause. And we substitute either swear words or um, words don't actually translate. So as a Western trained doctor, many years down the line, I went to Barts and the London Medical School at, at Queen Mary's University. So I studied my medical degree in, in England. And um, you realize that there are so many topics of conversation where women who look like me aren't seen or heard. And in a Western system like the NHS, you're delivering care which is white centric for a user who's able to navigate themselves around the NHS. And what happens if you don't have English as a first language or you can't navigate yourself around uh, the NH NHS care system? So we forget that as women, we are transitional beings. We don't just transition from puberty and then get pregnant and then that's it. We actually have very distinctive transitional stages. We're also cyclical beings. So every month, every three to four weeks, on average, a woman and a girl will bleed. And yet it's the most hidden thing in our culture. And I wanted to amalgamate my clinical knowledge that I'd accumulated, but also be true and authentic to my upbringing and be respectful from my upbringing that I came from. 13% of girls in the UK um, miss school yeah. due to their period. Yeah, and, that that's is, and, and I can relate to that, Dr. Nigget, because um, every month, uh, you know, school and university, when they knew that I was missing, they knew that, okay, she's on her period. It was that bad. 
And you're not alone in that. I mean, 13% is just an estimate. And I think it's higher than that because oh. it center is the figure that we know based on the fact that it's recorded that it's because of period problems. The number of times that women and girls will say, oh, well, I've got a headache or a migraine or I've got diarrhea and vomiting or I've got other family commitments or they'll make an, another excuse and so it doesn't get recorded as a period problem issue. And that's why she's taking time off school, off work. And it's estimated in the UK currently, and this is from uh, Caroline Noakes, who's the sitting MP at the moment for the Women's Equality Committee Summit and the Menstrual Health Coalition in, in Parliament currently in 2023, that we lose as women and girls in the UK a uh, billion pound in revenue. So we lose that much money from women taking time off work, time off school, not taking career opportunities, period products, the period products, period pain relief, hospital appointments, uh, missing various bits and pieces because they've got to go for their normal routine cervical screening or mammograms. Um, and then obviously heavy bleeding, that means that they can't get into work and their job opportunities are available for them. So the current sitting government know that this is the impact and globally, this is replicated. Women are money. And if we have to talk about money, and I hate talking about it because we shouldn't have to make an argument for our gender based on money, but actually that's the only way governments listen and, and politicians listen, right? And that's the only way we can make healthcare count. But it's more than that because actually time and time again, we've shown that if you make investments in girls at school so they're not missing time off school they're able to have better career opportunities and able to pursue passions that they love the economy as a whole thrives but we are only at the moment spending one percent of gdp on women and girls and women's health in this country and the fact that you can only change legislation once you've collected data and we really need to start having those open conversations for you to tell us this information otherwise how can you note it because there's still shame it's much easier to say to somebody i'm not going to come into school today or my daughter's going to be off school today because she's got a stomach ache it's much harder to say it's because of her period pain because you, you're there is embarrassment factor there and when there is embarrassment it gets hidden under the carpet or as we say you know when yeah. if you underneath more it means that we're not picking up the data and the statistics and we're not then picking up data in, say, Black and Asian women. So I work with a lot of marginalised groups. So marginalised groups aren't just Black and Asian. I'm working with, like, physical disabilities, learning disabilities, um, the deaf community, the visually impaired community, the neurodiverse, so those with ADHD and autism. There's no data on, uh, on for example, autism and menstrual health. But we know that that's very intrinsically linked. And so we're missing proportions of our society and what are we if we don't look after each other within our communities um, when we were having afternoon tea um and we were talking and you said uh periods aren't meant to hurt and yeah. there were small little facts like that um that we were discussing on that afternoon which uh, even i had to rethink and and re-question myself that i never even thought about that that period because we all uh, every month we'd sit with the hot water bottle and we take time off and then we just have a little party for one and we like to indulge and we're on the sofa that's what I personally do and I know a lot of women do and my friends do and so when you said some when you said parents aren't meant to hurt and I was like oh my gosh uh, we, it was automatic that when you have a period you will be in pain and when you had that like that's a myth breaker for me I was like Oh, and I really had to question myself. And I think I feel I have to go back to school myself and really relearn about my own body. So, what would you say are three tips for someone to really be self-aware as a young woman then? Well, the first is that, that your pain it cannot be nullified. The fact that it doesn't matter what age we are, we should be saying to nine, because the average age of starting periods now is nine or 10 years old in the UK. So at nine or 10, we should be telling girls, if it's painful, then you need to let me know. The thing that we've got to look at is again, data and research. So the data shows that we've used men's data and just said, yeah, women are smaller men. And so it's okay. And we, pain is subjective. So the data that we've done historically as doctors and healthcare professionals is that if a man complains of pain, it's far more important. And we have to take notice because men are meant to be strong and they're not meant to feel pain. 
Whereas a woman, because they go through periods, it's expected that you're, and childbirth, it's expected that they're weaker and more supple and therefore they are going to feel pain. And so their pain isn't that important. So therefore women and girls don't even go to their healthcare provider because within society, A, it's embarrassing to talk about the fact that you're having your period, although we have it every month. Then the next bit is, is, it's so shameful to say that you're in pain, it's better to stay at home and put up with it. So it doesn't actually inform me as a doctor that your lived in experience of sitting at home with a water bottle and having a party is normalized. Well, that's not what we should be doing. We shouldn't be normalizing it. So the first tip is, is vocalize your pain, being a drama queen. The second is, let's not normalize these conversations. They're important because they drive research for us as doctors. And then lastly, we should be looking for equity in healthcare. So why is it that certain groups within our society feel more pain than others? There is a lot of data around black women uh, actually being uh, not given pain relief when they go into a &E. And that's because of, again, biased, radical, uh, racist data that was done that said black women, because of their skin, have super bodies and don't feel pain as much because of their nerve findings. There is no scientific basis around that. So we've also, the third thing is, I've got to tackle racism and misogyny within the healthcare system. Um, so what should we do when we have extreme excruciating pain? Uh, uh, how do we approach our GP? And what does one say? I have a five point plan that I encourage everybody to follow very much because I am that GP. You've got to understand that currently the healthcare system is not set up for women's health. So we only have 10 minutes per patient. And you can't do the whole of women's health or understand period pain in 10 minutes. So you as the patient have to go with a list of symptoms. So number one, keep a list of your symptoms. When does the pain come? Is it a couple of days before the period? Does it stop when your period happens? Or is it after the period? But not just that, with the period uh, pain, do you get pain other times as well? So do you get rectal pain, bladder pain? Do you have bloating? Do you find that you're feeling dizzy? Do you feel nauseous? Do you feel sick at all? Are you taking time off school? Are you taking time off work? How much pain relief are you talking? When you're having sex, is penetrative sex really painful? Is that superficial penetrative sex or deep penetrative sex? So it's really important to have those taboo conversations and the answers to those ready for the doctor. Then the next thing is, is that you need to book an appointment at the GP who does women's health. Now, it might not be your regular doctor. So when you phone the receptionist, be honest and say, I need a double appointment to speak to a doctor that does women's health because I have pain that is limiting me and it's horrific every month. And you have to really be honest like that. Then the third thing is at your appointment, take a list of symptoms with you. You know, whatever you're doing, whether it's a period party that you're having every month, but I want to know what it is that helps you. I want to know your family history. So what was your mother's periods like? What was your grandmother's periods like? I want to know your height and your weight. And then I also want to know um, if there's any other medical history that you might have. And the reason that's important is because you not, might not see your regular doctor. It might be a nurse or a locum doctor that's in at the surgery. Then on the first appointment that you have with your GP, so number four, you might not get an answer. There are so many different reasons for painful periods, and I go through them in a lot of detail in my book. So it could be adenomyosis, it could be endometriosis, it could be fibroids, it could be the fact that actually there's rectal stuff. So it could be that you're constipated, it could be loads of different reasons why you're having pain. And so a good doctor should be at least investigating you by doing some bloods, they might actually examine you on the first appointment. So they want to do what's known as a bimanual examination. They might also want to send you for an ultrasound scan, but pain should always be investigated. Now, this is the sort of really important thing. And I talk about it in my book. A normal blood test and a normal ultrasound scan does not mean that you don't have those conditions. It just means that we weren't able to pick them up. Because things like adenomyosis and endometriosis, there is no test for that. So we go by your symptoms and your history alone. Then the last is, is that the doctor should be giving you options of what you want to do. Now, if it's the fact that it depends where you are on your transition and your life journey. If you've just started your periods and you're in your teenage years and you're not even planning a pregnancy, well, actually, if you're getting painful periods, one of the things that we think about is pain relief initially. That could be medication that stops the bleeding, so transaminic acid if you're having heavy bleeding, 
or methanamic acid, which is painkillers or ibuprofen or paracetamol. So we talk you through how you have those medications in regards to help with your pain relief. Then the next is, well, why don't we stop your periods? Because you don't technically need your period if you're not planning to get pregnant. So what we do is that we offer you what are known as long acting reversible contraceptives. That could be the pill, the mini, so that's a combined or a contraceptive, the mini pill, the injection that goes in your bottom known as Depavira, that's the implant that goes in your arm uh, for three years, or it could even be the coil. So the coil I even put in in 17, 18 year olds to stop their periods because I need to get a handle of the pain and try and stop it so you can carry on with your life while I'm investigating the underlying reasons. And that is the current guidelines from the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology on how we manage painful periods. And so taking a, a, a contraceptive uh, solution to stopping pain, uh, are there any side effects on the on the contrary or is pain relief the first most thing that we look at when it comes to a period? Well, it's all about what your choices are. So we always talk about pain relief first. But pain relief does have its side effects. So things like ibuprofen, neurofen, if you've got asthma or you've got reflux, then about 20 to 15 percent of the population who have asthma, actually, it might make their asthma symptoms worse having ibuprofen and paracetamol. So mm. it will be an option for them. And then if you're looking at contraceptives, yes, of course, there are side effects because we're giving hormones to suppress your ovulation. So that could be two hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Or it could be one hormone, which is just progesterone on its own. But actually, if you don't want to get pregnant, then using contraceptives to suppress your ovulation so you're not bleeding every month and the lining isn't coming away. So the level of prostaglandins, because the reason we get pain is because of this other chemical called prostaglandin, which increases, which I talk a lot about in my book, and you get an inflammatory response from that then actually what's, what are we doing by getting you to bleed every month? Well, we're not doing anything. We're not helping you in any way. We're stopping you from getting on with your life and going to school and having a fulfilled career and also being out of pain because being in pain is awful. It's absolutely horrible. So depending on what contraceptive you go on, you mm. can use it. And then when you're ready to start planning your family, come off it and your fertility returns. Uh, so in your book, it also says that when it comes to pregnancy, uh, that it could be uh, a, a hormonal imbalance and majority of women, uh, I think it was 29% that uh, are actually anemic. And then if you, there could be some very simple reasons why, uh, you know, you, you might not get pregnant. And so uh, looking at, um, and balancing your body, what would you suggest? But we need to look at pregnancy. So the, my pregnancy chapter is for men as well. 50% of making a baby comes from the man. So there's lots of advice about how yeah. much sex you should have, which is roughly two to three times a week. You shouldn't have too much sex because the quality of the sperm isn't so great. So a man should also be looking after his health, making sure they're not smoking, overweight, looking out for underlying sort of cardiovascular problems like diabetes or high blood pressure because 50 percent of the baby comes from the man yes. and it's exactly the same if there is god forbid a miscarriage 50 percent of that miscarriage is from the man as well so you need to also be empathy and also mindful of the fact that pregnancy is a combined job then yes. the next thing, what can the woman do well, we do know roughly, again, this is because of we don't have great data, but 29% of women actually are going to be anemic because of various reasons. We think that's more in Black and Asian women because of the risk of, say, fibroids. Fibroids is 80% more in the Black community, and fibroids can cause a lot of heavy bleeding. But the problem we have is that the blood tests that we use which are full blood count, so a full blood count, we check the hemoglobin. And the hemoglobin numbers are fine because you're looking at, so the total number of blood going around. But our bodies are brilliant at compensating. But the hemoglobin are, again, based on male data, men's data. We should, as women, be getting our ferritin checked. So our ferritin and our iron, because that shows us iron deficiency anemia from period. Unfortunately, a lot of women go into their doctor and the doctor goes, yeah, your full blood count's absolutely fine but not checking the components that make up the full blood count because women have periods. And we've never really taken the fact that women have periods into our calculation
for anemia. So we misdiagnose anemia a lot in women until it's very, very severe and it turns up on our full blood count. So that's number one. The second thing is, is your diet is so important. So that means having loads of iron supplements, vitamin D, calcium, making sure that you have a healthy, what we say is a rainbow diet, cutting out alcohol, stopping smoking is really important. And your weight is really vital as well. Weight and um, diet underpins almost every health condition under the sun. So it's so important that you keep yourself at a healthy weight as well. And then if there are underlying gynecological conditions like polycystic ovary syndrome, adenomyosis, endometriosis, fibroids, the fact that you might have, say, vulval lichen sclerosis, vulvodynia. I mean, there's so many gynecological conditions that I cover in my book that they could also hinder your impact to fall, falling pregnant. And then other, the other thing is mental health conditions. So if you're already on antidepressants for, say, anxiety or depression, don't come off them when you're trying for a baby, just let your doctor know. Ideally in the UK, what we should be doing for every couple trying to get pregnant is what we say, do prenatal consultations. So get them in, check their baseline, almost like an MOT to say, yeah. this is what you need to do if you're trying to get pregnant and prenatally prepare you. But what we don't have that, we just find the couple either that they come in and they're like, we're trying to for a baby and it's been a year and a half and we haven't fallen pregnant or we find that they are already pregnant and then they come in and then we're trying to do all the sort of management and trying to have the discussions about balance health and you are a great advocate and ambassador but where you really have I think have taken center stage is menopause I mean we didn't know about menopause I mean I, I, I asked my mom I was like I mean did you have menopause she goes but then uh, but then <laughs> she, you know she's like well I don't even realize and so this is a hot topic menopause and one that again is underneath the carpet and you've actually just said let's just talk about it let's just talk about menopause and let's just uh, because it affects more than 50%, like 50% of women. And menopause really because came from my own need to learn. I had to learn menopause because I wasn't taught it at medical school very much. But also because uh, I was working in Slough at the time, which is a huge South Asian population. So I was working at Crosby House surgery I did a lot of my medical training my junior house jobs at Wexham Park Hospital mm. and I see women come to women and I would see a lot of South Asian women and I couldn't understand their symptoms and no one had thought of perimenopause so that's when you're having periods and menopausal symptoms and it's only when I decided to go but they don't always come in with hot flashes so the data actually shows that and this is, we have very poor data, but 20% of women don't complain of hot flushes at all. That's not their symptom. They actually complain of other symptoms or very banal symptoms. So I was finding that in my clinics, a lot of the women would come in going, I could not understand that because yeah. I was like, blood tests are normal. Mm. You don't have arthritis everything is fine on when I examine you and then it was and then they'd be like but I'm still having periods and I was like well it's not menopause because menopause is one year without a period and so we don't have a word for it and I actually was you don't I was actually talking to other doctors on social media I started in 2019 um, really to ask other doctors I know that white women come in complaining of hot flushes, but what are our South Asian women? Because I don't believe this head to toe pain, you know, is um, depression, because that's what we're diagnosing them. Depression you know, right. And I was like, but that's not depression though. Yeah. Uh, because as a doctor I knew that that wasn't right but I had no other because all the clinical pathways everything in our western books is saying this is depression so I was putting loads of Asian women on antidepressants and they'll come back uh, you know yeah so something's not right yeah something right and they'll be like you know so you're looking at a group that is already 
doesn't have the lexicon to discuss this. And already a group of women who are not seen or heard within our clinical pathways in the NHS. And already now they're financially impacted that we're one billion pounds that we lose because they're leaving the workspace. Yeah. Now they're relying on the situation in the household and looking after, you know, arrange marriage so they are in this sort of sandwich generation where everything is on the woman and the woman is lost. And I was that doctor also that was so scared of giving hormone replacement therapy. You know, we did that, you sit in surgery and women would, and this is every woman, you know, Gordia and the South Asian yeah. women. Yeah, and, 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 and can you also explain the reason why we are, yeah. and it is given a, a, a bad name or a reputation for taking HRT out? Yeah. yeah, because in 2016, you know, 2015, there was that whole thing, uh, uh, and that was from the early 2000s as well. You know, breast cancer is linked to hormone replacement therapy. So I would actively be taking women off HRT and then come back, you know, going, I've got osteoporosis, I've got depression, HRT, you know, give me my HRT and I'll be so scared to prescribe it. And that's when I thought, I don't go to work to make people feel worse. I go to work because I want to learn. And really my social media started because I knew nothing and I was that terrible doctor that you go and the doctor knows nothing. And so it was, it, I went on a learning journey. Menopause is such a big topic. There's, there's not a few symptoms. There are many symptoms related to, to menopause. I, I met someone, but she said, I had the most, like I had palpitations. Like I actually thought something was wrong with my heart. Like that's how severe they were. And it was because of menopause and I couldn't function whatsoever. We spend a lot of money in the NHS investigating women, I mean, rightly so, but also women come in saying, you know, I get brain fog and we do dementia all year. And I'm like, no, it's not dementia. Or they're like, um, you know, I get recurrent uh, urine infections. I get urine infections. I get urine infections. I get estrogen. You know, there's genital urinary syndrome of the menopause or vaginal atrophy, which is even more taboo. And I think that, you know, we forget that as doctors behind closed doors, we talk about everything. But when you bring it out into the open, sex is you know, so important as women to have a good functioning sexual life. You know, there's a concept that as women, that's it. After 35, we're done. Everything's finished. And that's not true at all. Women are in the prime of their life, actually, when they approach their 40s. And you will know this as I will know this because I'm going, I'm 40 in February. Mashallah. And I have no, <laughs> I have, yeah, yeah, mashallah, I have no stopping. I want to do, I have pro- career plans and progressions and milestones that I want to reach because um, those are my aspirations. And we should be able to, as doctors, support that. But it comes back to the fact that we need to be able to support women to say this is a normal transition. But if it is impacting you, then rather than thinking that your palpitations is because you've got an underlying heart problem when you don't, it can be really scary. This is what we can do for you. I, and I feel that there's sometimes when you do go into the GP, one uh, uh, answer that you always get is, is it stress related? Are you stressed? I, I was like, no, I'm not stressed. And I, and, I, and I heard you say at the talk, you know, you should be drama queens. You know, really, yeah. we draw. I love. I absolutely love that. Could you explain that for us, for the audience here? I need that on a t-shirt. I should trade that. <laughs> you do absolutely. <laughs> the reason is, is because when I started doing women's health, particularly, and I was asking for certain things from my my colleagues, I remember going into. Uh, we have something called a prescribing committee where you get funding for various medicines. And I wanted testosterone, which is a hormone that we give women. Uh, It helps their libido, it helps their skin, their hair, and it really helps women who've had surgical menopause. So testosterone is a male hormone though. It is a a male, women have it as well. And there's a surgery that we do where we take the womb away and the ovaries. It's called a, a total abdominal hysterectomy. 
And by doing that surgery, by taking the woman's ovaries by surgery, we push her into something known as surgical menopause. And that means she loses 50% of her testosterone, gone. Now, if a man lost 50% of his testosterone, what do we do? We treat him and we give him testosterone. So I went to this uh, select committee, this medical committee, and I said to them, please, can I have testosterone on the NHS? And I got laughed at. And me and my gynecologist, we both got laughed at going, but no, women don't need it because uh, so what if women don't feel a bit of sexiness? And, it, and I was appalled at that because it's, it's a hormone that is vital for women as well. And um, I realized that there was a comment that was made and, and one of the women said to me, people always think that as women, when we go to the doctor, we're being drama queens. Yes. I need drama queens because when I go and ask for things as a doctor, and I don't get the backing of drama queens, I get laughed at. So I love drama queens. I want them to come and tell me that they're in pain. I want them to tell me that they have sexual dysfunction. I want them to tell me that they need their urinary tract infections dealt with. I want them to talk about, you know, their pregnancy issues, everything, because drama queens get shit done. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. And that's why I adore them, because they are the ones that make enough noise so that we as the healthcare professionals can actually come out of our ivory towers and take notice. Yeah, and I think, again, it's about confidence, isn't it? It's about having confidence in yourself and understanding your body. Again, I think, you know, at the age of 13, having my period, the first one to form at school, I was so shy. I, I shied away and I would big baggy clothes and, you know, and I felt ashamed. Like my body was changing and I don't think my mom really paid much attention. She's like, just, you know, I, th I think that we just kind of got along with it, but I felt so self-conscious being the first person. And I think that's why I'm so aware when my body changes, how I feel, have I not exercised? Did I not drink enough water? Did I not, not sleep at night? And I think that's what you've got to just be so in tune with your body, right? Like the first thing is to understand yourself. And that's why I wrote the book because I wanted to normalize to say that you do know your body the best. I always say that my 15 years as a doctor will never account for the lived in experience that you're going through with that condition because you're the expert. Mm -hmm. And women, and this is why I love doing women's health because women know their bodies. Like I'm a woman and I know my body really well. So I can go to the doctor, but I have a level of education. That means that I have a level of privilege and I understand that. But on just a simplistic level, women know themselves so well. And we as healthcare professionals and researchers and people who put funding into women's healthcare just need to trust them and believe women believe them when they say I'm in pain believe them when they say I can't fall pregnant and can you please find out why I can't fall pregnant believe them when they say you know there's a dragging sensation and I've got a vaginal prolapse and those are the things that we have stopped doing over time which means that there is a shame that clouds that we walk around with this so I've had to unlearn a lot of shame uh, as a woman who wears a hijab talking about this very openly because it is my life's work it's what I do and I think that the the thing that comes with unlearning that shame means that change happens but also amazingly enough it means that when I share something in my clinical room or my TikTok women don't keep that information to themselves I yeah. love it and uh, women will go going and I love it so much because then it's not my information. That empowerment and that conversation is not Dr. Nigat's baatki. You know, uski baat No, it's not. It's yours now, and it's a baton that you pass on. So me sitting with you over tea and coffee, talking about the fact that menopause and palpitations or the fact that um, these are the symptoms where not everybody gets hot flushes look you went home and you shared that with all your community absolutely and that's what we want we have to be able to be able to believe women and then talk about it unabashedly and, it, and I don't think it's even an education thing because 70 percent of my family are actually in medicine you, you can be educated you could be professional but it doesn't mean that you're having the conversation you're talking about it. So I think it's just allowing all women from all backgrounds just to, to just to open up and just to like, we sit around and we have a cup of tea and we had to have a good natter. And I think that's the first, 
starting point, isn't it? The afternoon teas, the lunches and the brunches where we start having these conversations and really to, and become drama queens because I have become a drama queen in the last few years because you have to you have to shout you have to like really rave on about who you are what are your ambitions for the future and where are you taking women's health oh i've got so many plans firstly the book is going to be translated into i think 40 different languages so mm. my public in the process of doing that and thankfully i'm so humbled that the book has become that conversation starter between the grandmother, the mother and the daughter. So we're not in silos in the home. So we're all having that conversation freely because there's there's almost like yeah. and so that's really, really good. But also you know, the men in our family are very much part of that conversation. What I want from people listening to this podcast to do is share the stuff that you have, whether that's your lived in experience, whether that's conversations that you've had with other people on social media, there's no shame or taboo or tag me into it. I will amplify that. It's about amplifying voices and mostly marginalized communities because I'm still learning. I'm humble enough to know that I don't know everything, although I've written a book called The Knowledge. And also I think that the thing that it comes uh, mostly is that we've got to be our own change makers in a world which is so ugly and distraught and horrific at the moment that the change has to come because not really for now, but for the next generation. And I'm always reminded of the words from Colleen Hoover, who is a writer and a, a poet, and she's an American writer and poet. And I've got her quote on my wall, and this is what drives me and drives me to do more for women's health is that she writes about women's pain and how we go through these transitions seamlessly without other people knowing, but we hold it within us. And so she goes, my grandmother went through it. My mother went through it. I'm going through it. And I'll be damned if my daughter goes through it. And so my future is, and my hope is, is to consistently say, I'll be damned if my daughters keep going through this. Oh, that is beautiful. That's so inspirational. I'm also going to give this book to my niece as well, the one who had the pain, painful period. She's like, oh, Khala, I can't go anywhere. I was like, you can't go in because I've been there. I've done that. And so I don't I don't want to I don't want to waste my life, you know. So I, I'm giving her the book. I'm, I'm giving it to, to for her to read and for her to kind of investigate for herself. So, also that you are part of some forum or you're starting some new um, collective. Yes, so there is currently in the UK something called the Women's Health Strategy, which is a 10 year strategy to uh, make sure that we have equity in healthcare for women's health. It's an all parliamentary, all government groups um, have taken part in this. We are going to be starting year three in January. One of the things that I keep coming back to, which I was talking about in this podcast, is the clinical pathways are very white centric for those who English is their first language and know how to navigate themselves around their healthcare sector. So we need to find out and know what marginalized groups are already doing because they've lost trust within the healthcare system. So Sam from Sagorn Through Cancer will tell you that she set up her own organization because there was nothing in the NHS. So Sam did it. And there are many, many, many other organizations like this. So what I did in the last two years whilst writing my book is mapped out all the groups that are out there that are working in their communities, whether that's Jewish communities, black communities, LGBTQ+, um, uh, South Asian communities. And remember, we're all nuanced with our own experiences. So black communities work slightly differently to Asian communities. We can't all be clumped into one. Mm. So the Health Collective was born on the 20th of September, 2023, uh, with myself and Dame Leslie Regan, who's the ambassador for Women's Health. And the idea is, is by having all these groups under one umbrella within the charity, Wellbeing of Women, that we can then drive the clinical pathways. And instead of going, well, what do black women, how do they like things um, communicated to them? Well, we've got them within the umbrella of the health collective. That will also drive conversations. It will also drive research. So if, say, big farmer like GlaxoSmithKline or um, Gilead, said we want to look at breast cancer research in black women well i know those groups that are already there because they've got the trust within the within their grassroots organizations to be able to get the feedback and participation in research so it's a bigger project which has never been done before but we're on the road to starting it 
I applaud you for that. When I heard about it, I thought it was absolutely amazing. And I am wishing you all the best for that because that is needed for sure. And the, the, this podcast would be amazing for that because if you are part of an organization and you're doing grassroots work and you're a marginalized community, I don't mind if you're not, you know, or with a lot of money or funding, then um, yeah, please find me on my socials, send me a message and we can get you invited to our meeting because our meetings are virtual and some of them are hybrid, so virtual and in place. And it's about mapping all the work that's happening. I'm sure there's more than 52 groups that we've mapped there's there's got to be hundreds and thousands it's just that no government has done this before so we're going out to councils food banks we're going out to um uh, shelters we're going domestic violence shelters we're going via schools uh so people within my group are going out even further because i'm very aware that we do have digital poverty we do have communities who aren't all plugged into uh social media we also yeah. have your cost of living crisis as well where people are just doing the work and that not invested in amplifying what they're doing but we want to be the ones to do that does yeah. does good health mean uh, uh an expensive lifestyle can we can we have healthy bodies and healthy lives on a budget yes of course i i refuse to buy into the fact that um you know, you need an expensive lifestyle because expense doesn't mean good health. Otherwise, you know, the richest people would be the ones with the best mental health in the world and they're not. And I can tell you that as a doctor or the richest people would be the ones without diabetes or heart attacks. They're not. They still have diabetes and heart attacks. Wealth does make you accessible to healthcare. That's where it's different. If you have more money, you can get earlier and better treatment for your diabetes. That's about it. But it doesn't mean that you're excluded from a health condition. What I think fundamentally good health comes down to is the, the three triads that make us, one is our good mental health, one is good physical health, and one is, I would say, your faith, whatever that might be. It might be no faith, but in believing something that is a higher being than you, that yeah. you have control over, and that at some point, somewhere, justice and fairness and kindness and humanity prevails, uh, those three things for me are paramount for good health. Yes, and there's such a, a, a power in prayer that we do. Yeah. And... So uh, what would you like to leave our audience with? And my message of kindness, really, for me, kindness is embedded in humanity. And uh, humanity is where I think we've forgotten how to be human over, the, you know, it's me, 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 one, 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 consumer, 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 uh, bigger, bigger, bigger. Um, and I'm guilty of it. I'm not going to say that I, you know, I don't like uh, the commercialization of things. I love it. Uh, I think that's it. But amongst that, we've forgotten our planet and looking after that. Uh, we've trusted our governments too much in regards to what they're capable of, when actually they're impotent in many ways. And we just have to look at the number of wars that are happening around the globe and you think that they'd stop. The pandemic, which was allowed to... Um, affect millions of lives in the UK as well, which was terribly handled. And we currently have the inquiry going on and, it, and everyone's reading that with you know, gawked faces, but that was our reality as frontline. I mean, I worked through that as a GP yeah. uh, uh, throughout the pandemic and the horror of death that I think is always um, awful. And uh, nobody should ever go when it's not their time. Uh, I suppose kindness is, is, is that it's, it's, knowing how to support someone at their lowest but knowing how to raise someone at their highest and then embedded in that is humanity but thank you so much for a wonderful interview an insightful interview how do we um buy the book and where do we find you so i'm all over social so that's tiktok uh, instagram twitter everywhere most of my conversations are about medicine i very rarely talk about world politics because that's i'm not an expert in that although i have my own personal views uh, which are mine and uh, um you can find me on there the book is all in all mainstream bookshops waterstones it's tesco in tesco's on amazon and yeah if you find me at dr nagat arif you'll find the link to my book thank you so much this is the book everyone the knowledge and it is so insightful look I've bookmarked it <laughs> I put pages in um and I was like I'm going to give it to it and I think it's such a great book as a gift 
you know, like if you have, um, you know, I think it's a perfect gift for Christmas, for, for birthdays, for women. It is really insightful, easy read, and these lovely small little facts illustrated that makes it easy to understand. And you think, oh, I need to investigate this. I didn't know this. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for a being like a, an elder sister or a, a sister figure that we can actually reach out to. And I'm continue making those TikToks because we love them. Oh, I will. I will continue. Uh, it's just time because I am still a working clinician. And, and yeah, thank you for all the love and the prayers. And I hope I keep continuing. I, I, I think that I'm an avid learner. I love to learn. I know I don't know everything yet. So uh, as long as I have that passion to learn, I know I'll continue to create. So it will be fun. Inshallah, inshallah. Dr. Nugget, thank you so much. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing.